All right, we are in lecture five. Let's get started. Um, so I went ahead and graded uh, homework 2.1. Uh, that's graded. The grades are should be visible now, um, and the solution is posted. If the grades aren't visible, let me know. Um, that's it, uh, I'm pretty sure I got that switch flipped right before class started, but I got um, I had a few students in, in my office today about uh, questions about a homework assignment in another class. So I just kind of got. Um, I think I got it turned on, but that, that's that's a simple fix. Um, one thing I'll mention about your homework assignment, if I didn't take off any points for this, but I did want to mention this. Whenever you're indicating your final answer, make sure you include the direction of the uh, of the reaction. About half of you, like you got the right answer, you did the problem correctly, but you didn't indicate that. And I, it's to, to be frank, it really wasn't a big deal on this assignment, but there are going to be some assignments later where it actually kind of is because we're going to have problems where um, we have reactions going up and reactions going down. Um, there are um, instances in the land of trust analysis where um, maintaining, you know, proper bookkeeping of, of your directions and whatnot um, is really kind of important. So I just want to make sure everybody's uh, on, on top of that. But for the most part, everybody did very well on, on that last homework assignment. I, I don't really see any uh, systemic issues um, other than there are a few of you that I think have the SI version of the textbook. I sent an email um, to a few of you uh, this morning. I was grading the homeworks, and if you got an email, I think you might have the wrong version of the textbook. Um, so I, I wanted to just clarify that. Um, it, it obviously didn't affect homework 2.2 because those were custom problems, but for homework 2.3, between the SI version of the textbook and the fact that I think there's a couple of you who might be still waiting on your book in the mail, if you check Microsoft Teams, um, both of the problems, <coughs> excuse me, both of the problems on this next homework assignment come from uh, page 92, I think it is, and so I just snapped 92 and put it on the team on, on the Teams channel. So if you check the Teams channel, the homework that uh, I'm assigning today through Monday, um, you can find those problems on Teams. So hopefully we should all be looking uh, at the same thing. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Other than that, I mean, again, I think that class as a whole, you all did, did fantastic. I'm not, I don't have any any real concerns over the material. I think y'all are doing really good. Sound good? All right, let's rock, uh, get to it. Um, so today, we're going to um, continue our discussion on support reactions. We have today's lecture, uh, and then we have Friday's lecture, and then we're going to move into our next module of the class next week, which is analysis of trusses. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to focus on concentrated moments uh, and fixed supports. So just to make sure, I just want to make sure that um, where we're at now. Um, so up until now, what we've been doing is taking structures and computing support reactions. And so far, we've obsessed uh, structures that are subjected to concentrated loads, distributed loads. And so those distributed loads can be uniformly distributed or linearly distributed. Uh, and then we have inclined loads. You know, one, one point I'll mention, uh, just a question right off hand, is could you have an inclined distributed load? Um, and the answer is sort of. Um, so it is possible um, in, in the real world. So let's say you have a frame that looks like this, you know, something like that. And then you have a, a load on this roof element, but the load is acting in the direction of gravity. So the load might look like this, right? Well, according to this member, if you're tilting this member over, it's sort of seeing, you know, an incline distributed load. But there's really not a whole lot that's noteworthy there from an analysis standpoint, because all you're going to do is collapse that into a point load, and then you're going to have an incline point load in the middle of the beam, uh, and you're going to handle it the same way we did all the other inclined loads. So it's not really going to be any different. But you can experience this in the real world. What type of load do you think would cause this? Snow. There you go. Snow. So, so a snow load could do that if you had an element that was at an in, uh, inclination. So again, another thing that I try and do throughout the class is I try and make sure that I'm not just throwing out weird structures that don't have a real life context. So like you'll find structural analysis textbooks that says, here's a distributed load and it's uh, mapped by the function y equals sine of x, da 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 compute the reactions. And, I mean, no. Like you don't see that in the real world. There, there are some instances where you might have to deal with 
trig for vibration and things like that, but not you don't really see that. So I just didn't really worry about it. So I'm trying to handle the real world as much as I can. Um, and then we've also assessed pen, pen boundary conditions uh, and roller supports, uh, both perpendicular and uh, with some degree of incline. And so what I want to do today is take this list and add to it. And I want to add to it with a concentrated moment. Okay. Um, so concentrated moments in the real world uh, arise um, from two sort of like uh, primary scenarios. Um, the first and most uh, ubiquitous uh, is the one that's later on the list, which is a cantilevered support. So a cantilevered support is just one where um, the end of the beam in question is uh, fixed. Um, so in the land of steel design, we saw those as those extended end plate connections where both the flange and the web were connected. Uh, and in the land of concrete design, that's when the beam and the column are encased together. Okay. Um, and what we find is that at the end of that, um, that beam, we have not only force reactions, but a moment reaction. And if you want sort of a visceral, real-world example of that, imagine holding a ruler in your hand and applying a vertical load. Not only are you having to keep the ruler from translating, so here's, we'll just use this marker here. So here's the marker, and I have this load that I'm pressing down. If I want the marker to remain stationary, not only do I have to keep the marker from moving up and down and left and right, but as I apply the load, I have to prevent the marker from rotating, right? If you remember in statics, so the depth, like one definition of a force is an action on a system that increases its tendency to translate, and a moment is an action on a system that increases its tendency to rotate, okay? So that's what the moment is doing, is it's a, a, a concentrated, induced uh, action to uh, uh, intended to generate a rotation. Um, so we see concentrated moments uh, in cantilevered support reactions. Another way that we see them, so here's an example of something that you might see in the real world. So if you have like a canopy or an awning or a, a, a balcony type situation, so you have some load applied to this floor beam, and so you can see that this this sort of, I'll call this element right here a transfer girder. It's kind of wanting to rotate. So what this column is seeing, this vertical column is seeing, is a concentrated sort of moment right here where that frames in, right here on that column, that uh, girder is wanting to rotate the column. Does that visually kind of make sense? So that's, that's sort of where we see um, concentrated moments in the real world. We also will have to deal with concentrated moments later. Some of the um, some of the things that we might be introducing in this part of the class, don't get me wrong, they have a real world um, uh, analogy, but some of them also have a, a dual purpose. And one of the things that we will see later is that we can use concentrated moments as an analytical tool later, uh, and we will use them later for computing a deformation. Specifically, we can use concentrated moments to compute a rotation in a beam. When uh, One of the things that separates this class from statics is that in statics you assume everything acts as a rigid body and you do not consider deformations. But the truth is every system has some degree of deformation present when you apply load to it. And so if you have a beam and you apply load, it will deform. Okay, Not only will it deflect vertically, but it will also experience some slope or some rotation. Uh, and so later on we're going to use concentrated moments to compute those rotations. Uh, so again, you'll see some instances in this course where some of the components that we use are analytical tools for later, like internal hinges, like concentrated moments. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to go through an example of how to compute um, reactions when dealing with a concentrated moment. And we're going to have uh, this example, which is dealing with the concentrated moment as if it is a, a, a load applied to the system. And our next example is what if the concentrated moment is an unknown? What if it's a reaction? Okay, so let's pull this up here. Okay, so we have here a, um, an overhanging beam. Uh, and other than this concentrated moment, I would argue there's nothing about this problem that you shouldn't be able to handle right now. I mean, we've already dealt with overhanging beams, we've dealt with fixed supports, we've dealt with roller supports, we've dealt with concentrated loads, distributed loads. There's nothing here that we 
can't deal with already other than that moment. And, and it's pretty easy to deal with. I just want to point that out. Um, so I'm going to handle this the way that I've been handling uh, problems this, this whole semester so far. I'm going to take this free body diagram and I'm going to start to indicate the, um, the, the unknowns that we have first off. So I've got vertical reactions at A and B, so we'll call this, um, oh, getting, getting ahead of myself, getting back, there we go. So we'll call this BY, call this AY, then I've got this horizontal reaction here, we'll call this AX, any insight onto AX? What is AX going to be? Zero. Zero. And, and some of you might be thinking, wait, does that concentrated moment affect com computation of horizontal reactions? No, it doesn't. And you're going to see where uh, it, it, it has influence here in a bit. But I propose right now, for the sake of discussion, that if you sum forces in the x direction, that moment is not a force. It's a moment. Okay? So if I'm summing forces in the x direction, there's nothing going on but this, so ax equals zero. All right. Now the only other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with this distributed load the way that I have been. I'm going to collapse that distributed load into a single point load. So if I do that, what would be the magnitude of that point load? 30. 30. And from A, how far from A would I locate that point load? Five feet. Five feet. Okay, because it's a uniformly distributed load, so the center or the centroid of that rectangle is halfway over. Okay. So here's my structure, and um, I'm going to approach this the same way that I've approached problems this, this whole um, uh, semester. So I've got um, two unknown support reactions here, one unknown support reaction here. So even though I've already solved for this, but in order to eliminate unknowns, and plus I think from a bookkeeping standpoint, I think it's a little easier to go ahead and sum moments at A. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So we're going to sum moments at A. Okay, so we're summing moments at A. And so we're going to handle this like we've handled any problem up till now. So do I have to deal with AX or AY? Nope. What about the 30 kips? Does it generate moment? Yes. Left side of the table, right side of the table? Left side. Left side, moment arm from A. Five feet, so 30 kips times five feet. So, and I'll just, for the sake of discussion, I'll do that off the side. That's 150. I can do that one in my head. So, you're just going from left to right. Don't have to worry about that. Don't have to worry about that. We handled that. What about BY? Does that generate moment at A? Uh, left side of the table or the right side? Right side, and then the moment arm from A is, what's that? 25, 25 feet. Okay, now we get the, the, the new part. We get this 20 foot kips, okay? So I'm going to ask the same questions. Does that generate moment at A? Well, my answer to that is yes, okay? And, and a simpler way of looking at it is I am summing moments for this system. Is this a moment? Yeah, it's a moment. I have to consider it, okay? Now, a simple question to ask is, should the stuff related to this 20 kips go on the left side of the table or the right side of the table? The answer is left side, because that's the way it's going. It is a clockwise moment, okay? But this is probably the, the, um, the single item regarding concentrated moments that confuses students. Do I do 20 times 35? No. No. Okay? A couple things to glean about that. I am summing moments. So if I look at this, this 30 times 5, 30 times 5, that's 30 kips times.
times five feet. So the units are going to be feet kip, right? The units are going to be in moments. If I multiply this times 35 feet, it's not going to be in units of moment. It's not going to make sense from, from that perspective. Because uh, it would be kips times feet squared. That's not a moment, right? The question is, so what do I do? I am, here's the answer, I am summing moments. That is a moment. So what do I do? I sum the moment. I just add 20. It is a concentrated moment. I am summing moments. There's no moment arm, no distance, just add 20. Okay? It is a concentrated moment applied to the system, and I am summing moments. No need for a moment arm or anything like that. Just sum it up uh, uh, with the rest. And, and my final uh, contribution is 10 kips. I am going to have 10 kips times a moment arm of 45. 45 feet. That is how you deal with concentrated moments. You just add them up. Again, like I said, I think from a, a concept or, or mass perspective, I think this is easier than the incline loads. You had to remember some rules and some methods with incline loads and incline rollers. With this, just add it up. Like, really what you need to do is make sure that you don't multiply by a distance. As long as you do that, you got no problems, okay? So this uh, right here, this is going to be 20. This is going to be 450. Um, so 450 and 150 is 600. 620, that is 620 foot kips. Or, you know, I can use that shorthand symbol, uh, BY times 25 feet. Might need some help on that. Um, what does BY come out to be? 24.8. 24.8. Do I have a second on that? Yep. And so that here, I'm going to scroll down a little bit so I can have some room to write. There we go. That's 24.8 kips, which means that we assumed BY was acting upwards. That assumption was correct. 24.8 kips acting upwards. That's my reaction uh, at B. And so if I have some forces in the X direction and I have utilized some, some of moments, I can then utilize some of the forces in the Y direction to solve for the reaction at A. And so I'm going to do this from left to right. So I've got AY acting upwards. Do I consider AX? Sorry, whoop, sorry, AY, I meant way Y. Do I consider AX in this expression? Why? It's okay. So I, I, I know that seems like a, a silly question, but there's a point there. Okay, I am summing forces in the y direction. Do I consider AX? No, because it is not a force in the y direction. Okay, easy, right? So let's keep going. I've got 30 kips down. I've got BY, which I now know is 24.8 kips. So do I put that 20 foot kips here? No. no, because it's the same thing. I didn't put AX there because it's not a force in the Y direction. Is that a force in the Y direction? No, it's a moment. So I don't uh, apply that here just as I don't apply AX. Okay. I posit to you that if we're not going to put AX here, we don't put that moment here for the same exact reason. Okay? D does that make sense? So, th so the only thing we have left is to make sure that we don't forget that we've got that 10 kip load acting downwards. And then there we go. So we have AY plus 24.8 kips is 40 kips and... Let's see, so AY, let's see if I can do that in my head. So that's 0.215. Uh, Did I do that right? I used to work in a convenience store, so I used to be able to do that stuff in my head. So. And then I became an engineer and forgot, I forgot. I became an engineer and I forgot how to do math. It's <laughs> a joke. Not really. Um, But do I have a second on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So to summarize, so we have AX is zero, AY is 
15.2 kips going upwards, and BY is 24.8 kips going upwards. All right. And there we go. Okay. Now, in the um, in the grand scheme of things, I do want to make um, a couple of just general observations. Um, if we look at the structure as a whole, did this 20-foot kips really have a major impact on the, the structural behavior and the distribution of the reactions? I would say no, because if I'm summing moments at A, I'm getting about 600 foot kips of moment just from the applied loads and only an extra 20 foot kips of moment from that concentrated uh, moment there uh, on the overhanging portion. So it really didn't change my answer all that much. But the only reason it didn't is because in the grand scheme of things, that number was pretty small. Okay? The point I'm making is that if that number was really big, it could really start shifting reactions down. And this could be one of those places where instead of an upward reaction, I have a downward reaction. Okay, and so it's just one of those things I want you to keep in the back of your head, and then it's starting. Uh, hopefully, you know, the, maybe the points start to sink in why the directions here uh, matter uh, very much. When we start um, having problems where we have a lot more uh, supports and a lot more support reactions, usually what I will do is just assume they're all upwards and not try and guess which one's upward and which one's downward, and just let the math work itself out. If they're negative, they're going downwards. If they're positive, they're going upwards. And so it's a way of just making life a, a little easier. There's, there's also some, uh, uh, even some theoretical underpinning to that, because when we write software programs uh, to analyze structures, that's actually what we do. We just assume all the uh, reactions are upward and to the right, and if they're negative, they're just acting in the opposite direction. So, uh, okay, uh, any, other, any questions on this? All right, so all right. So now what I want to do is I want to introduce uh, something we've been dancing around for a while and we haven't talked about yet, which is a cantilever beam. Okay, so cantilever beams, um, uh, I would say, are the most common uh, instance where you see concentrated moments in the real world. They are incredibly common uh, in the land of, of structural engineering. Anytime you have some sort of balcony or awning or extended platform, there's a good chance that you have a cantilever beam. So for example, you can see this right here. This is just a little canopy on a reinforced concrete structure and you can see so we've got the floor slab up here um, and then there's these two elements which jut out which are acting as stiffening elements for those supports. Those are cantilever beams. They are there to support, uh, to help support the load that's acting uh, on that uh, extended portion uh, of the canopy. Um, another place that you, uh, this might not seem like it makes uh, a lot of sense from a um, uh, from a, um, uh, a cantilever beam support, uh, but we can consider bridge piers uh, as cantilever supports because what we'll have is we'll have so here's the bridge pier, right? So here's here's the bridge pier, and then we've got sort of beams that sit on it, beams that sit on it. And so what's happening is those beams, so these beams are supporting the road uh, up, up below and all the vehicular traffic. So they are applying a pretty strong vertical force downward at these support locations because this pier is acting as the support for the bridge. So the, the support reactions for those beams are right here, here, and here, right? So what the pier sees is what the pier sees is this. It sees a bunch of sharp vertical loads, you know, right here. And so what's very common in the land of, of, of reinforced concrete design is how do we design the reinforcement that, go in, that goes inside um, the concrete pier right there? Um, if you haven't heard, you know, the, the two fundamental uh, uh, areas of structural design or the two materials that we tend to use are structural steel and reinforced concrete. And so we have two classes at Marshall for that. And so what is the major tenet behind reinforced concrete design? Concrete is a material that behaves very well in compression and very poorly in tension. So the way that we handle that is we put rebar inside concrete to improve its behavior under tension. That is reinforced concrete design in a nutshell. So how do you figure that out? You need to do structural analysis of this pier. 
And so one of the ways that we'll do that is we'll say, let's just look at this outstanding peer element right here and treat it like a big old cantilever beam and actually look at the distribution of the shears and moments inside that element and place our rebar accordingly. So that's another way that you can see um, you know, cantilever supports arise in the real world. Even though it doesn't actually, uh, um, it, you know, it's not a, an element framing into one, we as analysts apply that model because it makes sense for the structural behavior. Remember, we're not analyzing structures, we're analyzing mathematical models that represent them. Again, remember I said slight distinction, but it's, it's pretty important, okay? What I want to do is I want to look at a cantilever beam, uh, and I want to compute support reactions for this beam. Um, one of the things about um, cantilever beams is that I would say of all of the structures that we analyze in this class, and I'm not just talking about support reactions, I'm talking about shear diagrams, moment diagrams, etc. I think these are the easiest. I really think that cantilever beams are among the easiest structures to analyze because all of the unknowns are concentrated right here. Okay, so it makes your analysis strategy a, a lot easier. Okay, so okay. So here's our, our structure. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to compute the um, support reactions for this uh, this beam right here. Now, before we get into the support, we've got ourselves a inclined load. So let's make sure that we're all comfortable with that, okay? So I have this inclined load that's at a three to four, three to four slope ratio. So pop quiz, what's the hypotenuse there? Five. Uh, five, there we go. So that's a five, okay? Um, we've got this, right? So what I'm gonna do for this, um, this concentrated load is I'm gonna split it up into its X and Y components. So I'm gonna have a Y component that's going down and an X component that's going this way because they're both the load is pointing down and to the left so the, the components are down and to the left. So this vertical component, what is the magnitude of that vertical component? What's that? It's eight kips, okay? And just to make sure, the way that we compute that is we say it's 10 kips times we have our vertical leg ordinate and the hypotenuse. And what is that? That's really just the sign of that angle. Vertical over hypotenuse, opposite over hypotenuse. Um, and so this is eight kips. So if that's the case for this one, how do I determine the horizontal? If it's four fifths for the vertical, what is it for the horizontal? <coughs> Was that? Three-fifths, three there you go, or six kips. Okay. So far, so good? All right. So now we've got this cantilevered support, this fixed support, and how many reactions does a fixed support have? Three. Okay. So it has a vertical component, okay, and I'm going to call this a y. I have a horizontal component. I'll just assume that's that way. We'll call that AX. And then it has a concentrated moment. So right at that point right there, there is a concentrated moment. Um, I'll draw that like that. We'll call that MA. Um, and let's ask a question. So now we have to make assumptions, okay? Do you assume that, and there's no wrong answer to this, so by the way, are you assuming that this acts clockwise or counterclockwise? Doesn't matter, we can just pick one. What do you, what do you want to pick? Clockwise. clockwise, let's pick clockwise. So clockwise goes like this. And let's just see what happens. Okay. Now, speaking of seeing what happens, let's see about the problem. Um, in previous problems up until now, um, what we've been doing, so let, let's just sort of take a step back. So up until now, we've either had problems where the horizontal reaction was zero 
or the horizontal reaction was something that we could directly solve for. So we kind of, I don't want to say we ignored it, but we didn't really consider it in our strategy. But moments, that was a little different. With moments, we said, okay, we need to sum moments. Not only do we need to sum them at a particular point, but we need to sum moments before we sum forces in the vertical direction because we had these two unknowns in the vertical direction. So the idea was sum moments here so that we can solve for this one and then sum verticals to get the other one, right? Is that really a problem here, though? I mean, we only have one unknown in the x direction, we have one unknown in the y direction, and we have one unknown moment. So there's nothing preventing us from using these equations of equilibrium in whatever order we would like. That's kind of the nice thing about cantilever beams is we can solve for these reactions in whatever order we want. Um, so I'm just going to do it, you know, sort of in a standard order. I'm going to start off with the sum of the forces in the x direction. So we're summing forces in the x direction, but this is pretty easy, right? Because what do I have here? Do I consider MA or AY? No, but I do consider AX acting to the right, right? AX is acting to the right, and then what do I have going to the left? I don't consider this. When it comes to this incline load, there is a component acting to the right, uh, and that is, or sorry, acting to the left, um, and that is this six kips. And so what I'm going to yield is I'm going to yield an answer of AX is positive 6 kips. And because I assume that this is acting to the right, and I assume correctly, that's acting to the right. Pretty easy. Okay. What about summing forces in the Y direction? What about some forces in the y direction? What do I have? So going up, I have ay. Like with this, with the previous expression, I only consider the vertical reaction. I don't consider the horizontal reaction, and I don't consider the moment. As for going down, I've got 20 kips going down, but I've got this vertical component of this incline load going down, so I have 8 kips going down. So 8 kips, 20 kips. So therefore... AY is also positive, and because that is based on an assumed vertical direction, that means that my assumption was correct. Now let's sum moments, okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum moments at A. I'm going to sum it at point A. But some moments at point A, and let's see what we get. So do I need to consider AX and AY? No, but I do need to consider MA. Now, I have MA drawn clockwise, so let's, um, let's utilize a clockwise moment here. Okay. Now let's, um, let's handle the rest of these. Do I need to consider, okay, so let's look at the incline load. So I'm not going to look at the, the incline magnitude because I've got the x and y component. So let's look at each of those independently. Do I need to consider the horizontal component? No, because it goes directly through A. But what about the vertical component? Yes. Does that generate moment at A? It does. Do I uh, put it on the left side of the table or the right side of the table? The left side. And what's my moment arm from A? 10 feet. So I am going to have um, 8 kips. times 10 feet. And finally, so I consider the vertical, not the horizontal. I am going to consider this. My moment arm for that 20 kips is going to be how many feet? 20 feet. And um, do I put it on the left side of the table or the right side? Left, because it is generating clockwise moment. Okay. So 20 kips times 20 feet. So now, let me see if I can move that up a little bit. There we go. So now what I've got is I've got MA plus, okay, so 8 times 10 is 80, 20 times 20 is 400. 
So that's plus 480 foot kips equals zero. There's nothing on the other side. So what does that, what do you think that means? We assumed wrong. We assumed an incorrect direction. But that's okay. There's no big deal. Okay? Because what we're going to say is MA is minus 480 foot kips. But all that means is that we have a reaction of 480 uh, foot kips in what direction? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. It just means we assumed an incorrect direction. So we'll just indicate that like that. Just indicate that we assume clockwise, we were wrong. That's okay. So to summarize, so AX is six kips right, AY is 28 kips up, MA is 480 foot kips clockwise. We take a step back and see if anybody has any answers or any questions. I'll, I'll see if I have any answers. Anybody have any questions? This isn't too bad, is it? Yes, sir. So you want um, clockwise as positive and counterclockwise as negative because I know some professors, it's opposite. I know Beanie was like counterclockwise. Was oh, you're talking, okay. So that, okay, let's talk about that. So um, for the purposes of computing support reactions, mm -hmm. I don't really care so much about whether or not we consider up positive or down positive or counterclockwise or clockwise. Really, like all I care about for a final answer is that we have a magnitude of 480 foot kips and that we have indicated that it's counterclockwise. Whether or not it's positive or negative to me doesn't really matter. All I care about is magnitude and direction. Okay. Now, let me say one other thing. Okay. Later on, we are going to employ some methods where maintaining a consistent sign convention is important. Okay? A good example of one is software analysis. So whenever you plug a structure into a software uh, program, it's going to generate reactions, but the software isn't smart enough to know what you intended for a sign convention. So it just makes an assumption. And usually what it will do is for horizontal reactions, it'll assume right is positive. It'll assume up is positive for vertical. And for the most part, counterclockwise is assumed positive for moment reactions. Okay? But for the purposes of this class, I don't care what you consider positive or negative. What I care about is that you're indicating a magnitude and the direction. That, that's all I care about. Does, does that answer that a little bit? So, like, if you're, like, you don't have to draw the arrow a certain way. You can assume whatever you want as long as the assumption is resolved in the end. So. I don't micromanage formats. That's basically what I'm getting at. So, I don't do that. Because I, I don't think that you should be, I mean, that's, that's, in my opinion, that's not really how it is in the real world. I just want your designs to be right. And I want you to be comfortable doing the problem the way you want to do it. So. Now, I do want to mention, since we got a little bit of time, I want to at least introduce our final reaction topic. We're not going to get into the react or the actual uh, example, but I want to pull these slides up. Anybody have a, any more questions? This is good stuff. Okay. I want to kind of introduce our final topics. I want to pull these slides up. I won't spend a lot of time on them, but I kind of want to just make a point. Okay. So, um... What we're going to do on, on uh, Friday is we're going to discuss internal releases. Um, and as I've mentioned in the class before, so this is going to be our final topic related to reactions. And this is also going to be the one that's probably the most involved. Um, uh, internal releases are a point, or, or the way we define them analytically is that they're a, a particular point in the structure where a given response has been released. So a good example of that is a hinge. Okay. So like as an example, um, here I have a door frame. This door frame theoretically cannot resist a bending moment because as I apply the bending moment, it freely translates. Okay? 
I mean, I can put a little bit of force on it to overcome inertia and friction, but for the most part, it, it freely translates as opposed to if I apply a bending moment to this table where there is no hinge, the, the table resists it, okay? Um, we can have an internal release for shear and an internal release for axial forces, but the most common one that we experience uh, as engineers is a moment release uh, like a hinge. Um, and whether or not we actually have like an actual real physical hinge in the structure or a connection like this that isn't designed to transmit moment, we're going to treat these uh, the same way uh, analytically. Now the way that we treat these um, is we break out our secret weapon of structural engineering, which is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. Uh, and what we're doing is we're cutting a section. Okay, So I'm introducing this concept or this idea of cutting a section right now. I think I mentioned this uh, during our first lecture, like the idea is if I'm sitting here on one side of the table and you break out the samurai sword or the lightsaber and you cut through the table on the other side, I'm going to fall down. Okay. And the reason why is what you have done is you have released from the structure the ability to resist those forces. And so you can then use principles of structural analysis to figure out what are those internal forces in the structure at that point. And that's important for design because if you understand what the forces are inside the structure, you can then determine, okay, it needs to be a wooden uh, plank that's this thick in order to safely resist the loads. Or in the case of buildings uh, or bridges, it needs to be this size reinforced concrete beam with this many rebar uh, space this far apart, or what steel section do you need to use, uh, etc. Now, why do I, I bring this up here uh, is because, remember, um, we're dealing with internal releases, and so I want to show you what happens uh, when we cut a section, and particularly what happens when we cut a section through an inch. So if I have just some arbitrary point in a structure, and I samurai sword or lightsaber through that point, I propose that I can generate as, as much as three unknowns at that point in question. So I propose that inside the structure, I can have an unknown uh, axial force in the X direction, I can have an unknown shear force, or I could have an unknown bending moment. And I've got these drawn a, a very particular way. Like for instance, the force uh, in the X direction is of equal magnitude and an opposite direction, kind of like that whole Newton's third law thing. Um, basically what we're saying is that on either side of the section, doesn't matter which side of the section that you're look at, looking at, the force would be of equal magnitude and it would either be in tension or compression. And so we'll see analogies of that when we get into trusses and things like that later. Now this is what happens when you cut through just some arbitrary point in a structure, but the kicker is, what happens if you cut through a hinge? Well, like with an arbitrary point, you're going to have an unknown force in the X direction and you're going to have an unknown force in the Y direction. But the difference between this and this is that there is no unknown moment, okay? Because I propose to you that with a hinge, the moment is known. You know what the moment is. And what is the moment? It's zero, okay? So what we can do is we can use internal hinges to solve for reactions uh, of structures by cutting a section. Now, what I have here on this slide is our the sign convention that we are going to use in this class. Um, this sign convention, so I, I want to uh, make a point about this, and this is sort of alluding to a question you just asked a little bit ago. Um, there is nothing like magical or special about this sign convention. Um, what I would say, though, is that whenever you're performing structural analysis, it's not so much the specific sign convention that you choose, but so much so more that you maintain a consistent sign convention throughout your analysis. So I'll give you a truss analysis uh, example. In trusses, if you were to ask me to pick, pick one, I would say we're going to assume tension positive and compression negative. Okay, that, I tend to do that if I'm if I'm my back's against the wall because tension tends to make a member longer and or increase the length and compression tends to make a member shorter or decrease the length. There is nothing preventing me from doing it the opposite. I could assume compression is positive. There are software programs that do. Software programs that are um, intended for building design tend to treat compression as positive because they're like, here's the column, what's the load on the column? And any negative force, they say that's a brace force, and so that's a force in tension. Um, 
Again, it's not that you know they're doing anything wrong. It's just you have to be consistent throughout your analysis. Okay, I show these sign conventions and say that when we're doing shear moment diagrams and truss analyses, that for the most part we um, use these just because I think it's the easiest approach. Not necessarily that you have to do it this way. I just think this is kind of the the easiest approach for the analyses that we do uh, for most civil engineering structures. So, okay, off my soapbox. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to do next time is we're going to do this example, um, and we're not going to start the example today, but I just want you to kind of think about it. If you look, how many unknown reactions are on this problem? Total. How many unknowns? Okay, so you, somebody said five, okay? I propose to you that this is not an unknown support reaction because it's not a support, okay? It's not affixing the structure to the ground. The only uh, components that are affixing the structure to the ground are A, B, and C, okay? So how many external support reactions are there? Four. Four, okay? Now one of those we're gonna solve pretty easily, and that's AX, right? That's just zero. But here's where things get tricky. So I've got a vertical reaction here, vertical reaction here, vertical reaction here. But I only have two equations of equilibrium. I've only got sum of forces in the y direction and sum of moments. So right now, without cutting a section, there's no way of solving this problem. That's where cutting a section is going to come into play. Okay? And I'll just sort of end it there to say that with that's why we're introducing the concept of cutting a section, is to be able to assess structures that are a little bit more involved. Right off the bat, I can tell you this structure probably looks like a nightmare. It's not. It's really pretty straightforward. We're going to take our time with it, uh, but don't worry, uh, it's not so bad. Any questions? All right, I'm going to pull up the code one more time. That's all I got. I will see you all on Friday.